-hmm. Okay? Good. So, continue with the math lesson four. Right? Um, I promise you another way of thinking about the Peter Weil theorem, so let's do it a little bit more abstractly. Uh, it's the same thing, but said in a different way, and uh, you'll see how, how it makes things easier then to use this other language. Um, so, we have this Hilbert space, L2 of SU2. And let's see what, what is the structure we have found. Uh, it's, um, there is a basis which is labeled by J. So I can take this Hilbert space and take all the, the vectors which, have, uh, which are labeled by J, okay, and this is a subspace. In fact, the final dimensional subspace, because then this have a, um, a finite range. So this is the sum over J of some finite dimensional spaces labeled by J. J goes from zero to infinity. So this, is, of course, is an infinite dimensional space. So I have this tower. Um, uh, uh, J goes from zero to infinity, if you want. But I'm going to write it by half integers. And for each J, what do I have? Um, it's a little bit more tricky. For each J, I have the space uh, of, of matrices M and N. Okay, so the space of uh, matrices so is 2J plus 1 plus 2J plus 1. No? Um, it's like the space of linear maps from uh, a uh, finite dimensional Hilbert space to another finite dimensional Hilbert space. And the space of linear map is like the tensor product of the space with itself. Right? So this can be seen as uh, the space where these are uh, and an index tensor itself. And uh, what is this space? Well, this is a representation space in the representation J. So it's what we called before, how I call it? I call it VJ. Uh, it's probably better to call it HJ because it's Hilbert space. These are unitary representations. So this is HJ uh, tensor HJ. So that's the structure of this. Uh, it's another way of saying the same thing, right? Say there is this basis here. Um, but uh, this uh, notation will um, be very useful in a moment when we'll, we will have uh, several of these spaces attached to one another. Good. Um, now, uh, as you were saying, this has a lot to do with the uh, Laplace Bertrami operator or with the Casimir operator. So in this Hilbert space, we have this L operator, the left invariant vector fields. L, sure, is an operator there. Now, out of this L, you can construct a operator which plays a crucial role in the following. Let's call it C, which is L times L. So uh, L1 square plus L2 square plus L3 square. Right? So this is like the um, Laplacian, dx square plus dy square plus dz square, but not on a flat space, on this curved uh, manifold, which is, uh, which is SU2. Now, C, it's uh, SU2 invariant. Okay, this transform under SU2 on the right, on the left, uh, in a, in a, uh, they, they definitely transform in SU2, they're a vector, they have an index, so they rotate when you rotate. Um, this doesn't, it is SU2 uh, invariant. Uh, and uh, uh, its eigenspaces uh, must be, uh, must transform among themselves. In the under the reputation of SU2, and that's exactly what is going on here. You see, you're taking this space and you're breaking it in eigenspace uh, corresponding to a different representation of, uh, of, of SU2, where this 
um, which transformed in themselves, and, and, uh, and, and this is an invariant operator. Now, I'm not going to do the math, maybe you remember the Schur lemma, an operator which uh, commute with, uh, this commute with the action of the group uh, in an irreducible representation should be um, a multiple of the identity. So this is the identity on each of these J subspaces. And in fact, on each of these J subspaces, uh, it is uh, a, um, uh, it, it sends the subspace into itself, multiplied by a number, and this number is the uh, JJ plus one. It's the famous uh, eigenvalue of the uh, uh, total angular momentum. So in other words, all this to say that C operator acting on DJ M N of H, sorry, it gives back DJ M N of H multiplied by a number being J J plus one. In other words, this basis diagonalizes C and uh, um, the eigenvalue is JJ plus 1. Okay? Uh, why is the uh, HJ <coughs> tensor product HJ? The, the first line on the left. Just HJ. HJ tends for HJ. Mm -hmm. This is a space of things uh, uh, VM. This is a space of things uh, uh, VN. The tensor product uh, is the space of things uh, VMN, which is exactly what these things are. Okay? The, the, the tensor, it, it, it's a linear combination of. of uh, Couples of basis element. Okay. Okay. One more piece of information. Always, we always talk about that. Let's go a little bit into more detail. Let's do things a little bit more explicit. Um, always about SU two. So. Uh, let's look at this representation. J equals zero is a silly representation, right? Uh, it's a zero-dimensional representation where um, it's defined on C and uh, all the group elements are sent into um, one. Uh, let's look at J equal one-half. J one-half is a crucial representation, it's, it's fundamental. Uh, so it's fundamental. The dimension is j j plus one. Uh, uh, sorry, is two j plus one. So two j plus one uh, is two. So the dimension is two. So is the the v sorry h one half is c two. Okay. And uh, the elements here are uh, uh, couples of complex numbers uh, Z0, Z1 or ZA, A is 1, 2 and this thing has a name they're called spinners that's what a spinner is so a spinner is an element um, a, a vector in the uh, Hilbert space of the fundamental representation of SC2. It will turn out that C2 is also the fundamental representation of SL2C, so spinners are also the, the, the thing that transforms the fundamental representation of SL2C, and it will be subtle because C2 is both, carries both a representation of SC2 and SL2C in a sense which is very neat. Uh, what is D one half? of H, where it's very simple because uh, uh, it's just H, right? Because the indices here are AB and M and N here are the same thing as AB. Um, let's put them down for the moment not to get confused, uh, up and down all. 
So this is a representation which is given by, is a representation which is defined by SU2 as a matrix group to start with. And uh, 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 this is a Hilbert space. Remember, this is a unitary representation of a Hilbert space. Uh, so there is a, uh, a scalar product. So I should be able to know what is ZW. Uh, and the scalar product is preserved uh, by this. These are unitary matrices, so they preserve the scalar product. So what is scalar product is what we, you learn in elementary school to be the scalar product. Uh, so is Z uh, uh, A bar W B delta A B. So is Z zero bar W zero plus Z one bar W one. Okay? Why I'm being so pedestrian? Because not confuse that with something else, which is uh, uh, an invariant uh, product on C2, which is given by the fact that if you take H1 half, you tensor it with itself. Remember your elementary quantum mechanics. Uh, when you tensor to representation, you can you get a sum of representation in the tensor space. You can uh, split into invariant subspaces, so um, which goes from uh, J1 minus J2 from H0 plus J1 plus J2 H1. So when you do two of these, you can split it into uh, orthogonal subspaces, zero part and the one part. So which means that if you have two of them, you can pull up the zero part and you get a number. So there should be a map from two of these, Z and W, to complex numbers, which is SU2 invariant. What is this map? Well, let me write it down explicitly. Epsilon AB, where Epsilon AB is uh, 1 minus 1, 0, 0. Don't confuse with this is, which I've done for very long. <laughs> okay? This is a scalar product. This is a uh, map. Um, it's an SU2 invariant map uh, 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 from uh, uh, two copies of uh, H1 half into um, the complex number into H0. Let me anticipate a moment, just a little window, a um, few days in the future. We are going to do SL2C. As I said, this is also a representation of SL2C, but SL2C is not compact. And this is finite dimensional. This is a theorem that says that uh, unitary representation of non compact group are infinite dimensional. So this means that the representation SL to C is not unitary. There's no scalar product. There's a scalar product. The point is that the scalar product is not in SL to C invariant. It's SU2 invariant, but not SL to C invariant. If you act on these things with uh, HAB, HAB is unitary, so it conserves the scalar product. But if you act with an SL to C matrix, which is an arbitrary 2 by 2 complex matrix with the terminate 1 is not unitary, so it, it destroys this color product. So this color product is invariant under SU2, but not invariant under SL2C. This is invariant also under SL2C. Because this quantity, this object here, if you act with uh, any SL2C matrix, it stays itself. Let's, ch let's try. Um, H, let me write the indices, uh, write the indices like that. A, B, H, C, D, acting on epsilon C, D. You do the calculation and you get A, B. Every time H uh, is SL to C, so it's determinant 1. In fact, if you multiply by epsilon A, B here, this is exactly determinant equal 1. That's the equation that says that the term equal one. This is just looking ahead. So do not confuse uh, this with this. 
um, which is something in doing calculation one is tempted to. There are various, this is not a universal notation. There are various notations. Simone has its own notation. The mathematical book have a different notation. Uh, uh, all sort of notation for these two things. But the point is that let's distinguish these two things here. Spinos are beautiful, have all sort of uh, nice properties and uh, um, Atiyah, the guy who I mentioned before, says, wrote about Spinos that uh, Spinos, we understand everything algebraic about Spinos, but the geometry is mysterious. They are the square root of vectors, but nobody understands what that means, that's what he says. So, of course, I mean, it's just C2 um, with this invariant thing and this scalar product. So, but why are they square root of vectors? That's what I'm going to do next. In fact, to go there, let's do the next one, j equal 1. Uh, j equal 1 is a three dimensional and is the good old three dimensional Euclidean space that you all know. Okay, given SU2, you can write an SO3 matrix that rotates, so you can rotate every vector, they transform into themselves. So usually, uh, this is R3 and the vectors are usually written in the basics uh, VI, I being 1, 2, 3, and we all know about them. What creates confusion horrendously is that this basis is not the MN basis, the usual MN basis. The usual M N basis is a combination of V1, V2, V3. And in fact, uh, uh, how does it work? V0 is V3, V minus 1 is V1 plus I V2, and V plus 1 is v V1 maybe minus here, plus here by V2, something like that. Huh? Yeah, yeah, in fact, these are the eigen, the, these are the eigenvectors of LZ, the spherical harmonics, so the eigenvectors of LZ, exactly. Um, now, I just said that if you take the tensor product of two spinners, you can decompose it in the invariant part, in, in, a, in an invariant part and in a, in a uh, spin one part. So let's do it. I have ZA um, WB, uh, the set of these couples here, and uh, I can split it in two parts. So one part is just this number, whoops, this number here. So uh, ZA WB epsilon AB. This is a single number. It, it, when I transform this, with uh, SU2, this is invariant, so it's in J, it's a number. And uh, uh, what about, so this is a spin 0. What about the spin 1, um, Z, A, W, B? Well, there should be a way to map this into vectors, three dimensional vectors. Well, it's very easy. Sigma, A, B, I, this is a vector. Okay, so given two spinners, they define a vector. That's why Atiyah says that spinners are square root of vectors, because vectors are sort of square of, of spinners, in some sense. Penrose represents spinners with a little flag, has a geometrical intuition. I'm not trying to give it to you, I'll ask him. Um, so this is a, uh, now, uh, of course, we could also, instead of staying this basis, uh, represent, um, write the spin one representation as an object Z with two indices, a1, a2, 
which are anti-symmetric. So I take two of these, uh, sorry, which are symmetric. I take two of these, this is the anti-symmetric part. The symmetric part is what defines a uh, spin 1 representation. So another way of writing a spin 1, another basis if you want to spin, a spin, a spin 1 representation is given by spinos with two indices, so tens of spinos, uh, symmetric. And in fact this is true in general. Um, spin j can be written the vectors in spin j can be written as uh, a1, a2j, okay? completely, uh, completely symmetric. You can write a, a, a spinner, something with the index i here, and the uh, representation j, um, you have a1, a to J and you symmetrize. And uh, obviously if you act with uh, an uh, H A B on each one of these indices, uh, the result is still symmetric. So the space of symmetric things transform into themselves, therefore they form a representation and is irreducible by fact that is uh, spin j. So in fact one could just work with these things here all the time, it's just not convenient and that's not the way they're written. Um, when we started doing quantum gravity we were only working with things like that, uh, before realizing that it's better to go to the M basis and use what everybody else does in, in, uh, in, uh, in SU2. We're getting close to the end. Uh, let's do a few more facts. One more fact about this uh, tensor representations and then uh, intertwiners and then we're done with the math and we can go to physics. So two more topics. Um, so Remember the general angular momentum things. You have a, 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 a particle with spin j1, a particle with spin j2. Um, they form, uh, they live in two um, linear spaces. Linear space is not reducible. It can be decomposed into uh, irreducible, where uh, j3 goes, remember from your quantum mechanics things, from J1 minus J2 modulus to J1 plus J2. Right? Remember this. This is a basic angular momentum decomposition. Uh, so this means that uh, in the tensor product of J1 and J2 there is J3 which take this uh, value here. So let's write explicitly J3 is uh, more than J1 plus J2 and is or equal and less or equal J1 plus J2. These are called the Klebsch-Gordon condition between three spins. It's called Klebsch-Gordon. Klebsch Gordon, otherwise I misspell it. Uh, Klebsch Gordon condition. So every time you have three spins that satisfy this and uh, um, J1 plus J2 plus J3 is even, um, each one sits in the decomposition of the other two. So that's a condition for three spins for one to sit in the composition of the other two, which is the same thing as saying that H J1 tensor H J2 tensor H J3, um, the, the, the tensor product of all this contains J0. 
So there is an invariant part different from zero. Uh, let's do it in this notation here and see how all this becomes much simpler. You have uh, uh, an object with uh, two j, um, uh, two j one uh, indices. You have an object with uh, two j two indices, and you have an object uh, with two j three indices. You can write something invariant only if you can uh, close the indices with epsilons and do it completely. Well, here you cannot, so I have two, one, one too many, they were not even. So these are, say, A, these are B, these are C. 2j1 is a plus b, 2j3 is c plus b, and 2j2 is a plus c. And uh, it's just a line of algebra to show that if there are three numbers, three integers, a, b, and c, such that 2j1 is a plus b, to her, then these are satisfied. So the clevge gordon condition that you've probably seen in quantum mechanics, which is funny, mean just that, um, what I just said, so 2j1 is a plus b, 2j2 is uh, a plus c, and 2j3 is c plus b. If there are three numbers, a, b, and c, three integers, such that this is true, then um, the clebsch uh, condition is satisfied, namely, each of these Hilbert space sit in the tensor product of the other two, namely the uh, tensor product of the three contains an invariant part. Which means, if you want, that uh, in the in the in the in this big tensor space here, you can write something invariant. Um, you see, what is the structure of this? Uh, th this is something which indices a1, a2, j1, b1, b2, j2, c1, c2, j3. Right? So you have a 2j1 indices of th things sitting here, uh, 2j2 indices of things sitting here, and 2j3 indices of things sitting here. Now, you want something invariant. You want to map this into a number in a way which is invariant and SL to C. The only invariant thing is epsilon. So you cannot use a1, a2, because this is symmetric, and this is anti-symmetric, would give zero. So you need an a1 and a b1. So you need a certain number of epsilon AB, a certain number of epsilon BC, a certain number of epsilon AC. How many? Here they are, A, B, and C, because these are the epsilon connecting one index here, one index there. So you get this complicated object, uh, a a epsilon A1, B1, certain number of them all the way to epsilon uh, um, uh, B two J two C two J three, okay, which is an invariant object in the ten in this tensor, and there's only one. That's the only one, up to multiplication by number. Now let's write this not in this silly basis, but in the M basis, the one that diagonalizes LZ, so the one in which we started from uh, originally. So in this space HJ1 tensor, HJ2 tensor, HJ3, there is an object, let's write explicitly, with indices M1, 
m2 m3 which is invariant let's write explicitly what it means it means that d j1 m1 n1 of h d j2 m2 n2 of the same h d j3 m3 n3 of the same h acting on i um, m1 m2 m3 gives back itself n1 n2 n3 so it's invariant this is called an intertwiner it plays a big role is it intertwiner and this thing or a 3j Wigner symbol it's also another name funny name 3j Wigner symbol okay and uh, the standard notation um, is this one you have to say which representation you're looking at and the indexes this is that the same object written in a different notation and you go to Mathematica and they give them to you explicitly and it's called Vig 3 Wigner Three Wigner D, I forgot. So you look at Mathematica and uh, you take Wigner 3J symbols. You give J1, J2, J3, half integers, and 1, M2, M3, half integers. If you put into Mathematica 3J that do not satisfy this condition here, Mathematica says, Aah! what have you done is wrong. Okay? So they only defined four um, J that satisfy these conditions. The Wigner single is inter the intertwiner. So this is I, uh, M1, M2, M3. Which, I have to say which three representation are, are is exactly it. If you want, you could write it just a, a long bunch of epsilons, but in a basis which is an inconvenient basis. So if you want, it's just this long bunch of epsilons um, written in the in the in the common basis. This is basis dependent things. And uh, the basis like an ILZ is a common one. In other bases are simpler. In fact, this is one thing we were saying before. Um, suppose I take J1 equal J2 equal J3 equal 1. So I have three vectors. Okay? 1, 1, 1. And here instead of using the basis M, I use the standard basis of uh, IJK. What is the invariant object? What is the only invariant things with three vector indices? Come on. You have three vectors, give me an invariant number, which doesn't change if <coughs> epsilon IJK. And if you have three vectors, V, W, and Z, how do you do an invariant number? VI, VJ, WJ, ZK, Epsilon, IJK, which is the thing that you write V, vector, W, scalar, Z. The invariant triple product. So what is it? This is a mapping of representation 1, tensor representation 1, tensor representation 1, into representation 0, so it's the invariant part of the product of 3 representation 1. Good, I'm actually finishing in time with the last topic. Yes, great. So last topic. This notion of intertwiners is more general than this one and uh, it's going to play a key, key, key role in quantum gravity. In fact, intertwiners is what we work with a lot. But we will need not intertwiners between three representations, but intertwiners between four representations. So let's have J1, tensor J2, tensor J3, 
tensor J4. That's the last topic of the day. So this is a space of object. If you want object uh, um, V with indices M1, M2, M3, M4. And I want the invariant part. So I want the objects that uh, when I act with the representation matrices remain themselves. Satisfy this equation here, but not with three, with four. And I call these objects this, this objects uh, uh, intertwinings. Now, when I have three, I just I hope I convince you, but it's a theorem. You have just one possible intertwiner between three representations. But when I have four, I have more in general. In fact, I have a linear space of this, but a finite dimensional linear space of them. And the simplest way is let me just build it for you. One, and you will see. So the simplest thing is to. I want to intertwine four things. And I know how to intertwine three. Well, I just intertwine three with one and then one with the other two. So I use two. So I use two of these. These are unique, so it's particularly convenient. So I, M1, M2. And then I intertwine with some other representation. Let me call it K. So M in some representation K. And then with itself, uh, M, M3, M4. And I have to contract these two indices. But I know how to contract these two indices. And I have to contract how? Um, by gluing this representation together. So it's a HJ tensor HJ, uh, the invariant part of this. Uh, so there will be some M, M prime some matrix. I'll write this matrix explicit in a moment. But I can choose the representation I want here. So this is a representation J1, this is a representation J2, this is a representation J3, this is a representation J4. I can choose the representation I want. Well, not really what I want because I have the klebsch gordon conditions on both sides. So I have a certain possible range of representation that I can put here. And each one of these representations, these ranges here, so this will be in some representation k, here the same, will give me one of these. And any linear combination of these is going to be an intertwiner. So for instance, suppose I have uh, one half, one half, one half, one half. So here I have one half, one half. Here it can only be zero or one, because the angular momentum one half times one half, only zero and one. So I've only the, the, the general intertwiner will be a linear combination of this with 0 plus this with 1. Where here I have 0, namely I'm contracting this with this with this with nothing here. And here I'm contracting 1 half, 1 half, 1, which is exactly what the Pauli matrix is done. 1 half, 1 half, 1. So I have two Pauli matrices attached to one another. And I have the and I have you see a space with two dimensions of intertwiners. So this space here, which is the space of these intertwiners, is finite dimensional. It can be worked out explicitly. It's it's boring when you do the actual calculation, but somebody has spent time doing this actual calculation. Um, but it can be written explicitly, and it's called the intertwining space. So it's called sometimes just the H, J1, J2, J3, J4. And the elements here are, are the intertwiners. And I can use as a basis here the, the, the representation uh, in which I split things, right? The representation I put in, in, uh, in between. Um, you will see why this is important, and you will see why uh, this comes in in quantum gravity uh, calculations. Uh, 
I skipped a few details, but uh, I'll bring them when, th when they're useful. I've done everything, all the math which I need, which I could have done in built in the theory, but I prefer to put it, uh, put it all in front. I suppose part of this was familiar, you knew already, past part was new. Now you will see how in the theory um, it, uh, it comes in, but I would not spend more time with the math. Um, so tomorrow I'll just start building the theory. And uh, the way we build the theory is not by sort of deriving from a classical action. I will just give you the definition of the theory slowly. And uh, you will see how all this comes in. in, in uh. Do you have questions here? I was a little bit fast at the end because I wanted to finish the math, but if you have questions. Is there a particular paper or textbook you suggest to go over this in more detail? Um, in, in my book, there are uh, almost everything I've said is written here or in the other one. It's actually uh, a bit spread because uh, it's at the end of chapters, a little. Um, mathematical appendices at the end of chapters, um, but uh, um, uh, at the end of chapter one uh, there is something with spins, representation, spinners, uh, and uh, a little bit more ahead, uh, I don't remember which chapter, there's uh, the, the definition of the space of intertwiners. I just wanted here to you to know what they are, not to learn how to compute with them. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's all complicated. I mean, the three J symbols are mathematical, and this is just product of two three J symbols. I didn't say explicitly what it is, but there's a formula here in the book. Um, there is also an appendix on this book um, with some of things I said, but is more. It's more. Old, old mean there is more stuff. Somehow, the, the more you go ahead, the, the, the more you realize that some of the old stuff is not needed, uh, and you just bring out uh, things are complicated at the beginning. The more you develop them, the more they simplify. Right? This become uh, sim simpler. How much are you following? Everything part. At the end, I saw people more. Was it too fast at the end? From where? Okay, okay, quite fast. quite fast. Do you want me to spend more time on that or to go ahead and then come back to that when, uh, when we are there? Yes, I think it's a good idea to come back to this notion. Okay. These things become clearer with an example, so I guess when we're Yeah, to that's true. When you see it working, it's all complicated. And it's just, it's just uh, playing with the representations of SU2 and the way you tensor them and put them together. Good. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.